purpose, as stated by many of the people of the, of the time, that is, in the 19th, early 19th century, the aim, the goal of our southern colleges, not to find a job, not to go where the job is, but um, to be comfortable in your drawing room, in your fields, right. In your community, not opposed to, um, well, not an elitist understanding of the world. So at home in your library, which you, whose books you read and not just displayed as status, um, that is what they said. I'm trying to paraphrase the general attitude. Uh, I know something about Governor John Drayton who founded the college where I did both my undergraduate and graduate degrees. John Drayton who was from Charleston of the Drayton family. Um, he said just that, to be comfortable in the drawing room, in your fields, right, and in your library. <clears throat> Richard Weaver said the same thing. Now we're going 150 years later. Richard Weaver phrased the concept, this concept, as coming from Aristotle. Uh, Aristotle, by way of the Elizabethans, designed to produce the well-rounded gentleman, and now we would say the well-rounded lady. Uh, this, he said, in Southern, Southern Tradition at Bay, which is a book I like. Um, John Gould Fletcher said the same. I could go on and on about who said the same. In other words, I'm trying to establish the fact that it was common. This was the common acceptation. John Gould Fletcher, in I'll Take My Stand, which we've been mentioning several times. John Gould Fletcher has a chapter in I'll Take My Stand on Education, which is a must reading for everybody. I wish we had had it in our packet, actually. Maybe we can have it another time. But in John Gould Fletcher's chapter in I'll Take My Stand, he concluded that the purpose of education in the colonial and antebellum South was to, quote, achieve character, personality, and gentlemanliness in order to make our lives an art and to bring souls into relation with the whole scheme of things, which is the divine nature. To make our life an art, not to create art, to make our life an art. Um, he declared that education should, quote, produce the balanced character. That's the Horatian ideal again. The balanced character, the man of the world, in the true sense, who is also the man with spiritual roots in his own community in the local sense. You can be both, and you should be both. And so what has happened is the disjunct, the tearing apart of the, of the both. So he elaborated that current public schooling derived from Horace Mann. And if you don't know Horace Mann, you probably should read Horace Mann, especially during the years 1836 through 1848 in the public schools of Massachusetts, which, you now back to Fletcher, which ignored local and functional differences and resulted in producing a being without roots except in the factory. Now, that's what we got. In other words, our education in the South is Horace Mann. It's not John Drayton. <clears throat> well, if you're at home in the factory, you can go where the job is, and you don't have a sense of the local, of being rooted in the local, and, and a member of the community that you live in. I think that's one of the major problems with universities now. They feel better than their communities. They don't listen to the people in their communities. And <laughs> this dysfunctional academic well, I'm going to stop on that. I'm just not going to get into this. I could spend an hour on <laughs> talking about the dysfunction of academia, uh, which I was a part of for 39 years. <clears throat> well, also buttressing what John Gould Fletcher, 
uh, wrote uh, is a book by Merton Coulter. Some of you might know Merton Coulter if you know the University of Georgia. I knew Merton Coulter. He died when he was about 90-something years old, still writing. Uh, we gave him a little place in Five, five Kappa Hall, uh, it was the oldest building on campus, and he just, I, I shouldn't say junked it, but he put a thousand, thousands and thousands of books there. We found things when he died that he had checked out of the library 40 years ago <laughs> and, and, and returned. <laughs> and he was the most wonderful man you could ever imagine. Um, when they were throwing away things, hauling them to the dump, I took his little Confederate flag, which I treasure. He displayed it. And uh, Merton Coulter's book is called College Life, in the, College Life in the Old South. And this is the standard book. So he not only talks about South Carolina College, but the University of Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, the Old South in general, and the small schools. So there's your source um, if you want to elaborate on what I have just said. <clears throat> Go to Merton Coulter, Dr. Coulter. Uh, I looked into what entering freshmen had to uh, know in the 1830s when they applied for admission to South Carolina College, my alma mater, and this is what they had to know before they could even say, I would like to come here. This is eye-opening. It, it opened my eyes and I understood right away I'm not educated. After four years of undergraduate work and after eight years of graduate and undergraduate work. I am not an educated man. Compared to what you had to be as a freshman entering the South Carolina College in the year 1830. A good knowledge of Latin and Greek grammar, I could handle that. To have already read the whole of the Aeneid in Latin, not one book. Cicero's complete orations, Xenophanes Chiropedia, Chiropedia, which I had never heard of until I found that. Then I read it and I said, of course. <laughs> of course you should. Sallust, the book of St. John in Greek. The book of St. John in Greek. And at least one book of Homer in the original. Okay, that got you in, maybe, if you pass the test. So then the sophomore studies, after you got in, included Horace and Homer's Iliad. Uh, we, we know something about their daily routine. And I compared it to my students at the University of Georgia. <laughs> the daily routine of a student at South Carolina College in 1836, as described by one of the college students himself, sophomore. Monday and Tuesday recitations in Latin and Greek before breakfast. <laughs> Sounds like William Byrd. He would read Latin and Greek before breakfast and he'd go out and walk. I mean, this is the way we did it. If you were, if you were privileged enough then to go to a college, this is what you did. Okay. Then, every Wednesday and Thursday, we recite in Cicero, Cicero. And the other days of the week, not vacation, but Homer. <laughs> okay. The reading of Latin and Greek before breakfast then. And then I think about my students who can hardly get in at 12 o'clock because they've been at the nightclubs and are hung over. We have great nightclubs in Athens. That's where all these modern groups come out of, you know. Well, that's why they go to school there. They can go to the football games and they can go to <laughs> the nightclubs. <laughs> and, uh, well, we'll get off that subject. Now, I'm not saying all the students are like that, but that's, in general, what you get. You get excellent students. I've had some really wonderful students. Uh, so anyway, in South Carolina College in 1835, we know what we know, the, we know the staff, if you want to call it that. They had a professor of Greek, they had a professor of Roman literature, a professor of Belette, a professor of logics, a professor of sacred literature, 
literature, most particularly classical literature, the staple. So that was the curriculum of the day. Um, so I thought we needed to look at that. And then you can contrast the northern universities, which Jefferson called the seminaries, <laughs> with veiled scorn. And uh, then I like, a, I like a writer by the name of William John Grayson, who was from Beaufort, South Carolina, Beaufort. Um, he knew the North quite well. He was educated by tutors on, his, on the family plantation outside of Beaufort. Then he went to South Carolina College. He got in, obviously, because he was able to pass the requirements. Um, <laughs> he comments on education in Connecticut, uh, Massachusetts. He traveled a lot in the North, um, and so he, he went to graduation ceremonies at Yale, and he said, short on, sh short on academics, but very good because the women of the area could find husbands from the student body graduating, and it was good for business, but he, he was not impressed by the intellectual level. And what had been happening for so long is uh, people like Noah Webster had been undermining things. Noah Webster, whose dates are 1758-843, professor at Yale, he was so revolutionary as to desire that newly freed America should build a wall against the past and create an entirely new thing, so awe-inspiring, his words, that the glory of ancient Greece and Rome shall dwindle to a point. In other words, uh, okay, old people, okay, but the new thing will be better and we'll see that the classics then will dwindle to a point. That's what's happened. The classics now have dwindled to a point. So Noah Webster, uh, <laughs> who is not one of my favorite people, uh, he rejected conservative classical culture imparted by conservative language as bequeathed by the classics. He was a true revolutionary. He wanted to change the language itself, and he just about did. I mean, they, you could see what he was up to. Uh, his models, instead of the classics, uh, Thomas Paine, and if you know Thomas Paine, you know what, what that meant. And the other was Hobbes, okay, from Dr. Livingston, you know the Hobbesian um, way. And so he felt that our Southern way were, was, I guess he would say, corrosive to democracy or his style of democracy, and he said that. Um, R Richard Weaver in The Southern Tradition at Bay, once again, comments on this. If you want to read a little bit more, that's just really excellent. And he attempted to define the differences between North and South. This is Richard Weaver. In the 19th century, the period we we're talking about, by saying that the North had Tom Paine and the South had Edmund Burke. Well, that works. Okay, Don, I think it's about the same thing. So, Edmund Burke and his doctrine of human fallibility and of the organic nature of society, most specifically. Uh, so, in his righteous crusade against the ancients, Noah Webster went so far as to say, to say that the study of the classics is retrogressive for a democratic people. Uh, for us in the South today, this sounds strange, uh, and <laughs> according to Southerners at Yale, it sounded strange to them too, because they had been educated in the classics by tutors on the plantations, so they were able to they were able to, I think, counteract some of the what we would call ideological um, messages that they were getting from their professors. They didn't buy it, in other words. And I'm hoping that our students don't buy a lot they hear in the classroom today, too. 
and I think that happens. I mean, there, <laughs> those of you students here are probably not buying a lot you hear in the classroom. So see heads shaking. But uh, anyway, then we go to people like Joel Barlow. Joel Barlow was a poet that you probably never heard of. He, he did two long poems called Vision of Columbus and then the other one, The Columbiad. And you think, well, these are probably going to be epics in the, in the style of the ancients. Well, not. Uh, <laughs> Barlow attempted a poem, he said, freed of the fetters and forms of tradition. He condemned Homer's Iliad as pernicious, that's his word, <laughs> owing to its author's, author's anti-democratic doctrine. Homer didn't have a doctrine, but he used the term doctrine. In his own poetry, he would have, quote, none of the ordinary trappings of the societies out of which had come the great epics and epic heroes of tradition. The trappings he rejected, including any social hierarchies. So um, Joel Barlow, you know, as the head of the group of poets in colonial America called the Connecticut Wits. Okay. Now... Uh, Roy Harvey Pierce wrote a book in 1961 published by Princeton University Press called The Continuity of American Poetry. Um, I used that in my classroom one year until I read it well, <laughs> and then I haven't, read, I haven't used it since, but it's a Princeton University Press book called The Continuity of American Poetry. Uh, Pierce says the only tradition in the span of American poetry to, it is a development of the Puritan imagination. That's the thesis of the continuity. He's talking about a continuity uh, in poetry that's not Southern. And it's, I think it's accurate. I think what he does is, but then he uses that continuity as the only continuity. He says that is the only American continuity. Well... We so often see these sweeping generalizations that discount all the Southern writers that I am enumerating in my work on Southern continuities. So that Pierce declared that, let's quote, aside from a single isolated effort by a 17th century Virginia poet, there is no early American poetic imagination except the Puritan. <laughs> Princeton University Press. Major book, everybody uses it. I even used it. As testimony to Pierce's ignoring of the Southern poetic tradition with its con own continuities growing out of respect for the classics, Pierce refers to Homer only once in this book in a, in a passage uh, citing Barlow's denunciation of Homer. <laughs> there is not a single comment Reference to Virgil, Aeschylus, Sophocles, Ovid, Juvenal, <laughs> Horace, or any other Greek or Roman poet. Uh, so that's so telling. Uh, his American poetry is thus most definitely not our southern continuity. So we find in, let's go south, contradicting Webster and Joel Barlow, and I can name others, contradicting them, we find a man like Hugh Swinton Legree. Most of you don't know Hugh. Some do, some don't. Hugh uh, Swinton Legree was one of the Southern defenders of classicism. His dates are 1797 to 1843. He, he lived to be 47 years old only. Um, he called the Greek and Latin classics essential in teaching liberty, just the opposite of the other side. Uh, that is the liberty that is Jeffersonian, Aristotelian, as Don has outlined, not Lincolnian, Hobbesian. Um, I think these lectures are coming together nicely. You remember what Don said and plug it in right here. Okay, so um, William John Grayson was a classmate of Hugh Swinton Legree's. Uh, they went to school at the same South Carolina college that we're talking about. When he went north, he went, his family sent him north to uh, kind of like a little private school. And he said, uh, when I went north, I could find no books. 
to read, not when I could have devoured a library. The art of keeping school in the North seems to consist of making the most money with the least annoyance to the teacher and the scholar. <laughs> <laughs> My. <laughs> When he returned to South Carolina in 1803, he got prepared for college at, in the classics by local schoolmasters and, and his tutors, and he entered South Carolina College in 1807, where he said, I found an ample supply of books and the encouragement to read them. And this is really turning on your head what may, you may have been stereotypically thinking. He was particularly fond of Horace. And when he graduated, he graduated the head of his class. So um, <laughs> to Grayson's chagrin, he found that Webster, after investigated, remained a supporter of the French Revolution even after its excesses when Webster was resolutely defending the reign of terror. These are real radicals <laughs> we're dealing with. Um, <laughs> so. Adam Wolf, a, a writer that I like a lot, he writes for Chronicles. Adam Wolf writes that uh, through Webster's blueback speller for children, which taught five generations of American school children how to read, Webster was the proper father of civics, who confidently declared that his reader, devoid of religious writings, but enriched by the tracts of Thomas Paine and the abolitionists would replace the Bible as the book from which young Americans would read. <laughs> so you're putting dynamite under the culture at that point. Grayson's autobiography, and I recommend it. Rach, uh, Grayson's autobiography is what I'm cribbing from here a lot of. Okay. That uh, he attended the commencement at Yale in 1817 and Found, found the uh, graduation ceremony short on academics, but at least lively. Now, a graduation ceremony at the College of Charleston or the University of Georgia, the University of South Carolina, uh, the commencement addresses were given in Latin and Greek. <laughs> There's a bit of difference there, et cetera, et cetera. We could go on. Um, chiefly, uh, again, he said, chiefly important as being good for local New Haven business and most useful for abiding husbands for the community's willing young women. <laughs> I do like that. Uh, neither Yale nor Webster impressed him. So now an author that I know quite well, William Gilmore Sims, weighs in, and he says that Noah Webster is that notorious offender of the tongue who has, through equal ignorance and conceit, entirely overthrown the better English orthography and hath, corrupt, hath corrupted half of this goodly nation. Those are very strong words. Uh, so his corruption of the language extended to government and the college curriculum. Sims himself knew the classics as well as any writer of his day, uh, including Grayson and Legree. Um, so he called the classical Greeks, this is a quote that I like, the most refined intellectual race that the world has ever known. And he wrote that in 1854. He didn't change his mind. Some of his last poems were, and this was after the war and all the destruction he witnessed, he went to Aeschylus and Sophocles, of course he would, and he found solace there. And he, in one of his last poems he says, all this taken from us, at least we have the poets left us. That's something to remember when you think about poetry as some of us are writing today. That is what is to be left to us in the ruins. And the poets that are to be left to us, believe me, are the poets that shore us up and not tear us down. Okay, so enough of that. <laughs> I have a lot of material on Sims, but I'm going to jettison it. Because if you get me started on Sims, eh, it's over. <laughs> so no more about Sims. I'm going to shift to um, a writer that, who was in Sims' circle, Paul Hamilton Hayne. Some of you might know, probably don't know, Paul Hamilton Hayne. He uh, sat in the same classroom as Henry Timrod at the College of Charleston. He was, he was educated in, truly educated in in Greek, well, and Latin. 
So in the wake of Noah Webster and the Boston Transcendentalists who followed, the Transcendentalists, enemies of antiquity, enemies of the classics, enemies of all tradition, you know, and then, of course, Walt Whitman growing out of the Boston Brahmins, Walt Whitman, who tries to basically change everything traditional into a new thing, right? We, you know Leaves of Grass. All of us, I'll bet, all of us have read from Leaves of Grass. That's how serious things are. All of us have read from Leaves of Grass, but probably nobody knows Paul Hamilton Hayne. So with, you know, Emerson's influence on Whitman. Whitman said, I was simmering, 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 and Emerson brought me to a boil. You remember that famous, <laughs> you remember, you remember that famous statement. And so Whitman just uses the poet. Uh, <laughs> it is funny, isn't it? I hadn't thought I'd funny that. <laughs> the, um, the poet was an essay Emerson wrote saying what we want in an American poet. And Whitman read it, and he followed it, line by line by line by line by line. And all of you probably know that if you know American literary history, because that's what we get taught. That is our American continuity, after all, which is the only American continuity, after all. So anyway, <laughs> the, <laughs> ah, Whitman, Leaves of Grass. This is the new Bible for the new Adam, and I'm the new Christ, and I'm going to lead you. And tre uh, creeds and schools and abeyance. Abeyance means scrap them, all creeds and schools. And I'm creating the new thing here. It's a democratic new thing. It's based on all that stuff we're hearing coming out of the North. A real radical poet. Okay, here's Paul Hamilton Hayne, a poet of Sims's literary circle. He understood what Whitman was doing in undermining the foundations of classical traditional culture and thought. He made it clear in a letter of 8 March 1876 that Whitman was undermining the art of the ancients. Hayne reasoned that if Whitman is in any sense or any degree a genuine poet, then all the canons of poetic art must be reversed and their most illustrious expounders be consigned to oblivion from Job to Homer, from Homer to Horace, from Horace to Shakespeare. This he wrote in a letter. Hayne continued, were an angel from heaven to praise him to me, I would think it more probable that the angel was a false spirit. Good God, think of any mortal coolly writing such stuff as this. The scent of these armpits is a aroma sweeter than prayer. <laughs> <laughs> that just appalled him. It gets worse now. There are ladies here, and I'm, I'm not going to hold back. <laughs> Continuing with Hayne. And then the big shameless beast in his leaves of grass actually apotheosizes his genital organs, falls down and worships them as if some visible deity glowed in the spherical beauty of his doubtless enormous testicles <laughs> and his equally enormous penis. Excuse me, ladies. <laughs> Hayne didn't like Whitman. <laughs> and it was not just the grounds of the sexual uh, nature, the swaggering and vain sexuality, we'd call it, of, of Leaves of Grass. And we know now it was fake, a lot of it, really fake. So <laughs> the swaggering and vain sexuality, not the main issue, because he knew what the main issue was. It's, it's the... It's the main issue we're talking about, of undermining the cultural uh, registers. He'd been eating a sacred mushroom. <laughs> <laughs> he may have. In other essays and letters of the 1860s and 70s, Hayne expressed how radical and destructive to traditional Western ideals the poetry of Whitman was. Now, Hayne's biography, Raven, Dr. Raven Moore, was my colleague at the University of Georgia, and two books, his biography of Hayne and his collection of Hayne's letters. And so that's what I'm, I'm using here. Hayne was a legitimate poet. If you choose, I mean, he wrote a lot of poetry. He was like Wordsworth. He was like Sims. They wrote a lot, and you don't read it all. You just read the best. And so if you read the best of Hayne, you've got another Southern literary figure to add to your list, which most of you don't know. So I'll skip over that. Um, 
Hain continued to, I would say, attack is the right word, Whitman's poetry until he died. And one of his last things, one of his last um, efforts was to counter the New England attack on Poe. Here's another defender of Poe in the South. And he was able to, before he died, erect a monument to Poe at Poe's grave. This was Hayne. Hayne decided, okay, this is an unmarked grave in Baltimore. We got to do better. And so he sent around the world, being scorned in New England, he said, I went to New England and, I, and they, they snarled at me about Poe, oh, Poe, blah, 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 blah. So the people who wrote essays, little tributes to Poe in the memorial volume, which financed the gravestone, Tennyson? Oh, you, you, I mean, you look at them. All the great writers in England, they understood. Uh, I'm trying to think. Uh, the date would have been about 1886. And I'm trying to give you more names. Uh, I can't remember, but you look at that memorial volume. He made some money. That sold. The, the monument was erected. So um, we find in a writer like Sidney Lanier, who also said some of the things about Whitman. He, <laughs> he said, uh, I dislike Whitman's model American, liberated from traditions, the brawny, six-footed, open-shirted hero whose strength lies in the biceps. In contrast, my Democrat may have a mere thread for his biceps, yet shall be strong enough to handle hell. And Lanier had handled hell. If you know his story, he had been taken prisoner and, oh, well, he barely survived. In, in that hell. So I could then talk about Basil Lanoue Gildersleeve, uh, which I want, I think it's been covered nicely by uh, Dr. Dr. Wilson. Um, we really ought to talk about him a little, but can't. If you look then at the works like the Eclogues, the Georgics, you can see why they had to be anathematized if you're doing what these folks are wanting to do in the North. Cicero and his localism became eloquent on the subject in Da Senectate, which was a required reading for the senior class at South Carolina College, the complete. And I've read it, and I can see why it was the primary senior class um, text. And this is what Cicero says there. Nor does the farmer find joy only in his cornfields, meadows, vineyards, and woodlands, but also in his garden and orchard, in the raising of his cattle, in his swarms of bees, and in the infinite variety of flowers. And not only does planting delight him, but grafting also, than which there is nothing in husbandry that is more ingenious. He concludes, no life can be happier than the farmers, of the verdure of the meadows, the even rows of trees, and the beauty of the vineyards and olive groves. Why should I speak at length? Nothing can be more abounding in usefulness or more attractive in appearance than a well-tilled farm. <laughs> Whoa. If you're Emerson, do you want that? I don't think so. I don't think so. If you're Webster, I don't think you want that. So Cicero made it clear that the honest and virtuous statesmen sprang from those local men who tilled their father's fields. He wrote, in agris errant tum senators, that is, senators lived on farms. <laughs> Maybe they should again, but they understood that the best of governments honored the local community, not a distant Palatia Romana. Roman leaders came from the fields, and they did not come from Rome. Cities were the source of avarice and crime. These passages from Cicero must have hit particularly hard on those who strategized for northern ascendancy through amassing central power through mushrooming urban numbers that were in turn to be used in order to control a large centralized government. Reflecting the tried and true classical authorities of Western culture, the majority of the statesmen from the South came from farms. Fewer and fewer politicians were doing so in the North, which had cast its lot with the shining city on the hill. 
And so even Xenophon, Xenophonis, if you look at his, the householder, the Economicus, he says uh, there's no, oh well, I got a jettison. Read your classics. You can't go wrong, any of them. And you can see why they form a body of literature that has shored us up for so long, either knowingly or unknowingly. I mean, we need to pay tribute to them even though we don't know. I mean, take my word for it, pay tribute to them. You owe it. Now, <laughs> I have to jettison a lot here, which is fine. Uh, I say I've got 15 minutes left. So I wrote something uh, kind of special for you as something to say goodbye on, <laughs> in a way. Um, Southerners of the 18th and 19th centuries understood that the South was the direct heir to the world of the ancients. In the 20th century, Southern writers like Weaver, Clance Brooks, Donald Davidson, John Peel, Bishop, Alan Tate saw the South to be the last bastion of classicism in an increasingly materialistic, utilitarian, and anti-traditional world ruled by self-gratification. really haven't talked about that. That's Captain Matter when you talk about it. It's me. <laughs> and no community spirit. Um, self-gratification and the values of the marketplace. Our solid ancestors understood the culture from which they derived. Sims knew that Greek civilization produced, as he said, the most enlightened race of people the world has ever known. His fellow Southern author, Poe, wrote of the glory that was Greece and the grandeur that was Rome. That comes from to Helen, his poem. His cosmology described a primal unity in the past, a golden age concept from which we degenerated with each passing year. This in the 1840s, not post 1865. You see, we get accused of the backward glance, you know. After 1865, we idealized the past. 1840, Sam's Poe, our Southerners, our understanders of the classical understanding of the Golden Age, they already did. Now, the war comes and it reinforces, perhaps. But we have to, we have to realize that our understanding of past veneration, memory, that major topic, is pre-war. And it goes back to the beginnings of colonial settlement. It's classical. It's the classical golden age theory. All you have to do is read enough to see it. Well, the classical authors then um, who look at the past in the same way, they, the classical writers, declared, makes sense, the past is your friend. Why? You know it. The future is not your friend. You don't know it. Think about that. I mean, the past is your friend because you know it. The future is not your friend because it's unknown. Makes good sense. And it's to be feared, actually, because it can't be trusted. So then you have the progressive today and in the history of things that the pro progressive can only embrace the future. That's dangerous. The, class, the classicists would say that's not good. The past must be forgotten. It must be ridiculed or remade for the purposes of the future. The future reigns supreme. That's not a Southern statement. That's a non-Southern statement. So not so for the traditional Southerner throughout the centuries and stemming back to cultural roots, stemming back to cultural identity. Southern identity is thus predicated on continuity, continuity tradition and memory. That's the biggest word of all. That's the way to short circuit time, the relentlessness of time's passage. Memory does it in. You know, you have the Bergsonian concept of time as linear progressive. It's a modern thing. All you have to do is re remember and you stop it. That linear progressive Advancing era. Well, think about that. Memory is so important. Well, it's not concerned with creating a new thing. It takes its understanding of who we are as a people and valuing those who came before us. This is the classical pietas of loyalty to forebears and from which our word piety derives. This is classical veneration, as I've said before. 
One essential way to disrail and disrupt this sense of ourselves and pride in those who came before us is to debunk heroes, to remove their statues, dishonor their names, etc., etc., etc. In short, to call them unworthy so as to forget them. Memory jettisoned. Okay. Heroes are essential to identity. Okay, I think heroes are. I mean, the Romans understood that, the lives of illustrious Romans. Heroes are essential to identity. They teach by example. That's the best way of teaching. If you don't teach by example, you're not a good teacher. I've always thought you have to walk the walk, not just talk the talk. So they teach by example. When a people's heroes are media-made sports, music, and movie idols, which they are, (laughs) <laughs> only the present matters, especially the bank account and what, who, you know, you know the, you know the drill. Heroes, media made, sports, music, movie, idols, etc. When this happens, what passes for identity is vapid, shallow, superficial, and based on tinsel and the material gratification. Heroes, illustrious men and women of character, remembered and actively valued are essential to identity. So I think the cultural Marxist is at work. If you want to pull the rug out from a culture and practice cultural genocide, you take their symbols and you take their heroes. And what else now? I don't know. The Greek and Roman writers knew this clearly. So have Southern authors in their literary tradition. Again, their literary tradition. The materialistic Gilded Age um, has now given way to what I call the Age of Glitz. The Gilded Age (laughs) becomes the Age of Glitz and tinsel and bling, I guess. I forget. A new thing must be created weekly, maybe even daily, as the flavor of the week changes and with no memory of yesterday's flavor. That's the world we live in. Identity cannot be based on this kind of tenuousness and a sound bite mentality. Um, To do so leads only to a crisis of identity, ending with not knowing who we are. A crisis of identity. I think we're all in that crisis now. Or we're prepared for it if we're not in it already. So, okay. What comes? The confusion of the spirit, the hopelessness of American modernism. Man thus becomes easy prey to sinister designs without being shored up. And I call it designs on purpose. It's not by chance. I would like to think it's just, you know, (laughs) by chance. It would do well to remember where we came from. These origins are tried and true. They've been around a while. And they can even reassert themselves with tenacity. Uh, When young people at Hampton City or Sydney are studying classics like some of us are, uh, it's very invigorating to hear that. So they can reassert themselves. And they can reassert themselves with tenacity because they're sound. If you get something that's not sound, okay, maybe not, but these are sound. Genuineness has a way of remaining when the glitz of falseness is relegated to the fleeting moment and the passing fad. So it's only left to say, (laughs) keep the faith, (laughs) like our ancestors have now, for four centuries. This is our time to step up. It's both our birthright and duty as Southerners and as men and women of Western civilization. Okay, we've got two and three, three minutes.